the question often arises, where, why are people violent? In fact, why do we need these laws in the first place? Why doesn't everybody just live peacefully and happily ever after? And that's because, whether we like it or not, in human society and throughout the animal kingdom, the relationships among any social creatures, whether these are ants in a colony, wolves in a pack, birds in a flock, baboons in a troop, or humans in a fifth grade class, it's based on some combination and some conflict between cooperation and conflict. Social creatures need each other. We band together for mutual good. But within that group, there are times where we're going to compete with one another for resources that we think are scarce. It's food, it's shelter, weapons, mates, money, bling, whatever it may be, where co co both cooperating and, and, and conflicting with one another. And so over the course of history and even prehistory, Different individuals evolve different strategies for doing this. Some people, as we know, are sort of pleasant and easy to get along with, and they're very cooperative. And others seem to take great pleasure in preying on other people and exploiting other people. So some individuals may be violent because their family tree has selected for the kind of brain wiring that, ask, that, that, that acts first and asks questions later. They may be somewhat impulsive. They may be somewhat irritable. There's a range of neuropsychological hormonal, um, physical factors that go into determining why people, some people are more violent than other people. And like anything else, life is a bell curve. Any trait you can imagine, think of any human trait, height, weight, strength, athletic ability, musical talent, whatever it is, there are going to be some people on one end that are going to have very little of that trait. There are going to be some people on the other end that are going to have way too much of that trait, and most of us are going to be somewhere in between. And it's, it's the same way with a predisposition to violent behavior. We know violent behavior runs in families. We know this from a variety of studies. Uh, but we also know that it is also dependent on the context. Uh, in an earlier segment, I talked about the forensic task of predicting dangerousness. One of the ways you predict dangerousness is based on the characteristics of the person, but it's also based on the characteristics of the environment that that person goes back to. So somebody who may have a tendency to commit violence, if they're going back into a stable family structure, if they're going back to a circumstance where there's not high availability of weapons or drugs or alcohol, the tendency to commit a violent act is going to be much less than somebody who is going back into the wrong kind of environment. So yes, there's a biological component. There's also a social component. Remember, individuals who inherit a biological predisposition to anything, good or bad, high musical talent, verbal ability, athletic ability, or violent behavior, are going to be raised in the same family that bequeathed that genetic capacity. So it, although we like to do these studies of, of children who are separated at birth and raised in a different family, this happens very infrequently. So if we're raised in a family where we see fighting and conflict and, and, and competition all the time, then that's going to sort of reinforce and marinate that genetic potential that's, uh, that's going to make the, the trait even stronger and, and more difficult to control. And finally, there are social factors. You know, there, there are different periods in history, there are different societies throughout the world that value aggression and violence more than cooperation and, uh, and, and peacemaking. So you put all these together, that's going to determine the violence potential of any one individual. From a theoretical and a philosophical point of view, that's important because there are certain things you can change about a person, certain things you can't. You know, right now, at least, we cannot change a person's genetic inheritance, we cannot change their brain wiring, but we can change the environment. We can potentially change the kind of societies we raise children into. At the same time, it's important from a practical point of view, because again, when we're trying to determine how, how guilty someone is in the commission of a crime, and you'll see this all the time. People have had a traumatic brain injury. People suffer from dementia. People have bipolar disorder. They'll say, there's something wrong with my brain chemistry, therefore am I less responsible for this crime. That may be true, but it may not be true. People often create their own environments. If I have musical talent, I'm going to scour my neighborhood and find some other kids who like to play in a band that I'm going to fulfill my music. If I'm a kid who likes to read and imagine and, 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 and like stories about things, I'll find the one library in my neighborhood. And I may have to sneak into it so my friends don't make fun of me, but I'll find that library so that I can read. But if I like to be a badass, and I like to beat people up, and I like to steal things, I'll find the other punks in the neighborhood to hang out with. And this is something that's called active gene environment correlation. People with a tendency actually go out of their way to find environments that reinforce that tendency. So it becomes very complex. It's not just, okay, we'll take this person, put them in a different environment, and therefore they'll change. No, they may 
scoot out of that environment and find the environment that, that they want. In any given case, it's going to be a combination of wiring, a combination of family, and a combination of society. And both for research purposes and clinical purposes, we have to take a good hard look at all three components.